Hey there, my name is Darren, and I'm the owner of Legendary Corals. I'm really humbled to be a part of the Restock from Home segment, and I've asked to talk about what are easily my favorite corals. Zoanthids. So, a quick little history about me and Zoanthids. Zoanthids were actually the very first coral that I owned. I remember trading an old light fixture in a Target Plaza for some Rastas, Sunny Ds, and Darth Mauls. Once I saw how bright they were and all the colors, I was just poof, super hooked. And their small size was perfect for my little nano cube. There were just so many varieties for me to collect. And being able to physically see their growth by counting each new polyp, how they look like little bouquets of flower, knowing that there's never ending amount of colors out there, it was just, you know, it was addicting. And even now, those same things that pulled me in the first time, over a decade ago, are the reasons why I still love Zoas. Anyways, that's just a little background on Zoas and how I fell in love with them. Hopefully those tuning in or who are just starting the hobby, or, you know, you're already an aspiring Zoa collector, know exactly what I'm talking about. That strange need and excitement to grab and collect these little water polyps and stir out all those tiny details they have. And while that strange need and excitement over those first three Zoe frogs is how I got to where I am today. Over the past decade of keeping them and seeing the hobby change, I can tell you what's worked for me and my own thoughts on Zoas. The first one isn't exactly something like flow, but more so the observation I've come to have that benefits me when it comes to Zoas. Let's just dive into it. In the wild, or at least I think anyways, these little encrusting pops might have been collected in a little nook and cranny, wide out in the open, exposed to high currents, low currents, tide pools, deep waters, low light, high light, muddy water, you name it. Most likely, there's a zoa somewhere in one of those places. Being found in all these different environments means that they all have different preferences. They come in all sorts of body shapes and sizes. Some zoas are small, some are big, some are teeny, and some are gigantic. Some zoas look flat in body shape and some are plump, some get long lashes and others stay compact. I noticed this and eventually started to suspect that maybe all these different body shapes and traits could mean that they're all different species of zoas. I mean, reefers who keep acroporas can differentiate all the different species based on the skeletal structure, so why should zoas be treated differently with their pulp structure? When zoas are imported, they're just polyps on a piece of rock that a diver chiseled off. There's no story on how and where they're collected, perhaps a Karachi origin, but that's it. So how do I know what it prefers? Observing the body and shape of an unfamiliar zoomorph and linking it back to another zoomorph I know of gives me a really good idea on what to expect. And here's one example. There's a very well known zoan strain called Pink and Golds. It's known for being one of the fastest growing zoas in the hobby. It's characterized with big polyps and has large clear trunk-like stalks. This characteristic is most apparent when they're kept in low light and they end up stretching. Their polyps also turn more of a drab color when exposed to low light. When you give them really high intense light, the polyps would just become way more flat, all the glitter color would almost condense down, giving it a much more appealing look. The skirts would then get pink on the tips and thus the name, you know, pink and golds. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, not too long ago, a zoa came into the hobby called Nirvanas, and I noticed it had very similar physical traits. When I first first purchased a zoa, I had a pretty good hunch on how things would turn out. Fast forward a few months, and the Nirvanas end up being extremely fast growing, dull out and stretch heavily when under you know not given enough light, and they would come back back down to size and condense with these marvelous glitters of rainbows as coloration. Sound kind of familiar? So when purchasing Zoa for the first time, I try to focus more so on their body and shape rather than their pattern. I use this observation as a starting guide on if I think the Zoa will do well for me, along with a good guess on what its needs are and what to expect out of it. Use this tip as a good starting point with Zoas you're unfamiliar with, since you should be able to see which ones with physical characteristics are already doing well in your own system. Moving on from that little observation tip about Zoas, uh, there's going to be about five key things that come to mind when I keep zoanthids. They're stability, nutrition, flow, lighting, and quarantine. 
So the next thing I'll go over is stability, which is the greatest strength of any reef tank. Without stability, your reef tank that your Zoa calls home is constantly changing. Zoas can't focus their energy on growing and instead spend all their energy adapting to their new environment. The change in environment not happens not only happens through fast parameter swings, but by something we're all a bit guilty of, and that's tinkering. In a short time span, there are way more ways to do harm to your reef tank and fewer things you can do that will benefit your reef. I'm guilty of the same things, and here's one example. You, some of you might remember the Chady Reactor fad where it was all the rage. I decided to try it out on one of my Zoa heavy tanks, thinking my nutrients were really high in there and that every reef tank benefits from Shado. More pods, natural form infiltration, you know, it just sounded like a win-win to me. Fast forward a few weeks, Shado's looking plumpy and green, but my Zoas, they started to pale and shrink in size. They've lost their large plumpy look and vibrance that they once had, and I correlated the decline in health with the Shady Reactor since that was the only change I've made. That Shady Reactor was really expensive and I didn't want to go to waste, so I ended up buying more fish to help compensate for the Shady Reactor. Long story short, the react the Chato and the reactor melted away for reasons I'm told was due to depletion of iron, and eventually I had an empty Chato reactor with a tank more heavily stocked with fish than previously. Uh, eventually, algae started to kick in, and I had to reduce the amount of fish and then increase the cleanup crew. The Zoas in that tank, they were stressed out, closed up, some getting covered in algae, turning pale, y you name it. And while all this was happening, Zoas and my other frag tanks that didn't have to deal with the, my whole Chady Reactor fiasco, they were fully grown out and ready for a new fragging session. That's just one of the examples where I learned that tinkering is you know, not always the best thing and it eventually led to a loss of stability. I experienced firsthand on how important keeping a stable system was for a coral that I thought was pretty much bulletproof. And that Chater Reactor incident segues perfectly into the second key element for keeping zoanthids, nutrition. The zoanthids in my previous story became stressed and pale because the Chato was consuming the nutrition that they relied on. In my experience, most zoanthids benefit from a tank with higher nutrition. Providing higher nutrition can be achieved in many different ways. The simplest way is to have a tank stocked with fish. I mostly keep tanks in my system because they're like the cows of the reefs. They graze algae all day and thus create waste all day. The tank stays clean, clear of algae, and now there's nutrition for the zoanthids. For those with tanks too small to have tangs, I recommend feeding your tank. You can use solids such as Benefits, Benepets, or Reefroids, but liquid supplements work the best for zoanthids since they're able to absorb it through their tissue. I personally use Brightwell products, but there are many other brands that are popular. Pick one underdose the instructions, and see how your tank responds over the course of a few weeks. If there's no adverse side effects, such as increased in algae growth, go ahead and increase the dose. Repeat the same process until you eventually reach the suggested dosage on the bottle. This is how I approach products, since I rather let the zoanthids tell me if they like the product, rather than just hoping that the instructions on the back of a bottle is going to make them happy. I will warn you that when feeding your tank, be sure not to provide more than your tank needs. Yes, the Zoas will love you for all that nutrition, but you're gonna run into algae issues. It's a teetering seesaw effect when it comes to pushing the envelope of how much nutrition I can offer as methods. And honestly, sometimes I just get lost in it. I look at how awesome they're doing, I'm like, eat up, my precious beauties. Eat till your heart's content. Thinking that they're gonna grow up to be big and strong, and this is how I show my love to them. Sort of like when you visit your grandma's and she stuffs everything in your face. But instead of having zoanthids with little round tummies, I instead start filling the bellies of algae. This is when I back off and realize that I'm going overboard. You can definitely keep zoanthids without feeding them or in lower nutrient tanks. But in my experience, I want to recommend it if keeping zoas is one of your long-term main goals. The next key element I want to bring up is flow, and in my opinion, this is the most important thing when it comes to keeping zoanthids. Zoanthids rely very heavily on flow in order to keep the tritus off of themselves. As zoanthids grow, they spread the tissue outwards on the surface they're attached to, and eventually little polyps come out that new growth. 
as exciting as it is to see a new pulp emerge. This also means that a new structure is being formed that now blocks flow from entering around that tissue mat. Once that small frag turns into a colony with dozens of polyps, detritus and other debris is going to settle down and get caught in between each of those polyps. Here's an analogy. Think of it like going to the beach and the only way to get clean was a small water faucet. You're out having fun, playing beach volleyball, and now you want to clean your head. If you're bald, you've got nothing to worry about as the dirt is just going to slide right off with minimal or no effort. However, if you've got a head full of hair, you're most likely not getting everything off using that, that little faucet. You're gonna need to take a full shower with strong running water in order to get anywhere near clean. And now imagine if that water faucet was the only way to wash your head and for some reason you lived on that beach 24 seven. After months at a time, more debris is gonna pile up and while that's happening, your hair is also getting longer. But longer hair means more dirt is getting cut. And frankly, you're gonna have some awful hair and other skin problems like pimples in your scalp and who knows what else is gonna develop. In that analogy, the zoanthids are the hair, and the tissue mat is the skin. A small frag is like having little to no hair, and debris comes right off with a little bit of flow. A colony is a head full of hair, and now has all these polyps that trap detritus. This is why most reefers are able to grow zoanthids frags out very well, but once they reach a certain size, they just tend to melt away. The polyps full of detritus either get zoopox, which in the analogy are the pimples, or they close up or get covered in algae or get infected and then eventually they just die. As zoanthids grow in size, it's important to give them access to more flow to help remove the detritus stuck in between their polyps. And if you can increase the flow in the area they're growing, be sure to spot clean them with a turkey baster to blast off all that gunk. Just be sure to siphon it out or else it'll end up back on them or another coral. Having said that flow is important, it's also in my experience that zoanthids can't just be blasted with too much flow in the beginning. A one polyp frag has very little matting and that thus not much to anchor itself onto the frag plug or rock it's glued on. Too much flow can easily blow it away. However, as I mentioned earlier, they require much less flow to stay healthy. So start small frags off in lower flow, just enough so that the detritus sweeps off of them and allow them to safely grow and establish a solid foundation. Once grown out, you can place them into an area with stronger flow as a more permanent growing solution. The next key element to keeping zoanthids is lighting. I've tried many different types of lights from T5s, mix of reef brights, radions, aqua illuminations, china boxes, you name it. I've currently settled down on using Kessels. I found that zoas do best when kept under a more blue focused spectrum. I personally keep them under 100% blues all the time. Whites to me are mainly for aesthetics and for taking photos. Zoanthids are not light demanding corals. They probably don't even get much white spectrum in the natural habitat, so I don't see a need to provide one in a coral farm setting. On a 12 inch tall frag tank, I run my Kessel 360X units at 80% intensity for 10 hours a day with a mounting height of 24 inches above the waterline. This gives the tank a nice even spread of light that is not too intense. A general rule of thumb for zoas is that it's far safer to keep them in lower light than in higher light. Zoas will physically tell you if they need more light by stretching their stalks. If they receive too much, they may become severely stressed and start to fold inside out, exposing the filaments and shrink intensely. So always start a zoa in low light and move them to higher light as needed. Once you've found a spot where they're no longer stretching for light, leave them alone. Zoanthids will change the color according to your tank settings over the next few months and they'll settle down faster if undisturbed. Your zoas are, if your zoas are physically doing well and growing, but you want to color them up more, look back into the nutrition. Just be sure to leave your lights the way it is. The last key element to keeping zoanthids is proper inspection and quarantine. Unfortunately, zoas are prone to many pests. They're full of polytoxin and apparently some little critters find that delicious. Some common zoa specific pests are zoanthid eating nudibranchs, zoanthid spiders, and sundial snails. All it takes is one of those pests to make it through a dip and your years of hard work are at risk. The most common and difficult pests to handle in my opinion are zoanthid eating nudibranchs. 
Adult and baby nudibranchs don't really die for most dips. They rather just get kind of irritated and fall off. The eggs also don't die from dips. There are guides online on how to spawn and treat these critters, but there are a few things I personally do to make sure I don't get them. The first is to inspect every polyp and cranny on any new frag or colony. I then give them a dip, then sit for a few minutes, and then turkey baster them to loosen any unwanted hitchhikers. After the dip, I rinse them in salt water, I inspect them once again, and then I place them in a tank that's separate from the main frag tank. There, they settle down to new homes for a few weeks to a month, and once deemed clean, I will then only move them to a main system. Having the zoas in a separate system makes cleaning and dipping them a breeze, and for those looking to collect and grow zoas, consider a quarantine tank as a security measure for all of your hard work. There's a lot of cheap all-in-one tank systems out there you can purchase either new or used. Just fill that small tank up with water from a water change, toss in some existing media, slap on a light, and you're all set. Doesn't need to be anything fancy, but this one small step is going to save you so much head and heartache. And that's my video segment on how I view and care for zoanthids. I hope that this was at least a bit valuable to those tuning in. Feel free to reach out to me if you'd like to know more info on zoanthids or if I can help with anything else. I try to keep a basic care guides for all the morphs I offer, so if you're curious on how to keep any of them, just swing by my site. Thanks again Reef Builders for giving me the opportunity to talk about these cool little corals. Take care and happy reefing!